Jeremiah chapter 21. <clears throat> the theme of it is too late. Now, I'll explain that in a minute because it's never too late to pray to the Lord, and the Lord is never late in answering that prayer. Prayer looks to the restoration of the one who prays. Isn't that true? Uh, that's what prayer is all about, is directing our words to God in hopes that God will answer you know, our prayers, whatever the needs may be, uh, whatever the wants may be. And oftentimes our prayers are needs and wants that we're requesting from God, not necessarily praise and adoration and, and focusing and giving him the glory for what he's done in us. And prayer is an interesting doctrine, isn't it? There, there, there's so many interesting things about the practice of prayer itself we have churches that uh, practice prayer in all kinds of strange ways you know from pentecostal to pentecostal to very conservative um, I, I i can remember being introduced to a calvary chapel and sitting on a wednesday night and they used to break up in little groups before the service would start and we would pray for one another and I remember how strange it was for this individual to pray for their cat. And I just thought to myself, pray for your cat. Why would you pray for a cat? It was sick. She loved the cat and she didn't want the cat to die or, or continue to be sick. And so she had this love. And so to me, it was strange because my idea of prayer was you don't go to God for little things like that. You go to God for big things, you know. And I didn't understand. I was in air because you can go to God for anything, which is which is wonderful. And and we see some churches go to another extreme where they're just very Pentecostal. And Pentecostal in a sense that they're they're moved by emotions and feelings. They're jumping up and down and praising God and praying to Him and demanding things from Him and so forth. So prayer is an interesting doctrine. I had a great discussion with someone this last week about about prayer. It was George Washington that was a man of prayer that helped him through his own um, difficulties in life. And this was written uh, from the perspective of a person that saw him pray. It says, one day a farmer approached the camp or heard a earnest voice. On coming near, he saw George Washington on his knees, his uh, cheeks wet with tears, praying to God. The farmer returned home and said to his wife, George Washington will succeed. George Washington will succeed. The Americans will secure their independence. Now, what makes you so sure, Isaac? The wife asked. The farmer replied, because I heard him praying. And then he said, Hannah, out in the woods today, and the Lord will surely hear his prayers. He will, Hannah. Thy, the, thee may rest assured that he will. And so he recognized George Washington's prayer as being sincere and, and moving in his own heart that he knew God was going to answer him in that prayer. Principles of prayer. And these are principles that I found in Scripture, like, Lord, teach us to pray. And we know that from from the Lord's Prayer, the disciples asking Jesus, teach us how to pray. And so here you have 12 young men that come to the Lord and they're creating this relationship and they see the prayer of the disciples of John. They see how Jesus prays and so they want to also pray that way. So you see the desire that's in them to pray. And that desire comes from the Holy Spirit, from that relationship with Jesus Christ to pray. If you're a person that doesn't pray, then you need to pray that you can pray uh, and seek the Lord that way. The prayer needs to be sincere. It's not seen by men. Uh, Jesus made it very clear. Glow into your closets and pray. Don't pray just to be seen by men. You know, make sure that you're doing it on a regular basis between you and the Lord. Uh, the model <clears throat> prayer has 64 words in this Lord's Prayer. Uh, 64 words... Uh, can can be said slowly in less than one minute when you look at the Lord's Prayer, which means that the prayer should be brief. It doesn't have to be long. You don't have to get into details. You can be very short and brief with the Lord. You know, supply my needs, Lord. That's all I need for today. You don't need to go down uh, some great list and these are my needs and here's the cost of every need. And if you add those together, then this is what it comes up with. And so could you give me that amount so that I could pay for all those needs? You know, be brief, just like the Lord's Prayer. 
uh, definite. God knows what we need. God knows what we need. The prayer shows whether our wishes is according to his will. When you read the Lord's Prayer again, thy will be done. Thy will be done, Lord, not our will. It's simple. 49 of the 64 words have one syllable. So it's very simple. It's not elaborate. You don't have to use mighty words. You don't need to speak in the King James language. I I remember that years ago that there was a guy that would speak that way. Uh, when he ever, whenever he prayed in a group, uh, he would use the King James language, and he would say, "Thy Lord God Almighty," you know, and he'd speak that way. And it's like, what does God only understand the new old King James language? No, He understands our language just fine. We don't have to speak a speak the old King James. Just very simple. Uh, we know that the prayer talks about forgiveness, asking for forgiveness and giving forgiveness. It's practical. You know, it gets right down to the necessities, the bread, forgiveness, just simple guidance for every day. And it's relevant. It's recognized as divine. Thy word, thy thy kingdom, and thy name will be done. Sometimes prayer is simple, very simple. Remember Peter was in the boat and Jesus asked him to come out and he began to sink. And do you know what he did? He prayed. And he prayed very simply. He just said, Lord, help. The shortest prayer in the Bible, Lord, help. And the Lord helped him back into the boat. And so our prayers don't have to be long. They can be very simple as long as they are sincere. Sincere prayers. Prayer is fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. And it's expressed in adoration, thanksgiving, and intercession. Though or through which believers draw near to God and learn more of His will for their lives. And Scripture stresses the vital role of the Holy Spirit in stimulating and guiding us in prayer. The word Holy Spirit, again, it needs to be in the power of the Holy Spirit. I find that prayer is to be a connection with God. It is. It really is a connection with God when you connect with him. Uh, so many can come up with an outline on how to pray properly. And you can pray properly. And it's wonderful that you can pray properly. But have you connected to God? You know, Paul said, when you pray, pray without ceasing. Well, how do you do that? How do you pray without ceasing? Uh, without ceasing means that you're praying constantly. That you're constantly talking and speaking with God. And that's what he's basically saying. That's a move of the Holy Spirit in an individual's life when they sense and know that God is with them at all times. And so they can talk to him all day long as they're going about their day because they're in constant communication with God. And that's all prayer is. I find it interesting how some people are connected to that and some people are not. If you're not praying, if you are not praying, then you're not connected. Something's missing. You've got to plug that connection in. It's just kind of like the, the Wi-Fi. You know, if you don't hit that little Wi-Fi button, that little symbol that shows the Wi-Fi going out, your computer's not connected. And you're wondering, why can't I get to the screen? And you realize the Wi-Fi is not connected. And because it's not connected, you can't connect to what's out there in the world, all the answers in the world. Uh, and so... You're stuck. You're stuck. Prayer draws you closer to God, and then God moves because you're sincere in a desire to glorify Him. I find it interesting that <clears throat> some people can see the urgency of prayer because of some situation that happens in their life. Whatever that situation may be. And so they immediately begin to pray. But they don't stop there. They reach out to others. And they say, you need to pray. Not just in the church. Not just with friends. They even will go beyond that and reach out to neighbors. And in fact, (laughs) they'll get to a point where they're 
at the shopping center and they may see someone they don't even know very well, but they know they go to church and they'll say, can you pray? You know, and they just know the power of prayer. And I think that that person has a connection to God. And I think that God hears that person and answers their prayer. You know, I think of Laura. You know, when it comes to prayer and urgency, she's been through quite a bit. But she knows how to pray when you need to pray. Uh, She's battled cancer. And she knew that the only way to get through this was prayer. And boy, she had everyone praying. She was asking everyone to prayer and putting on the prayer list and the prayer chain. At the time, we didn't have a prayer on the, on the website, so it was just all prayer chain. And everyone prayed. And it was just amazing to see her go through all of that and come out, you know, just fine with it. And then her, her daughter's baby, again, the same thing. She saw the urgency. And boom, God just intervened and worked because she understands prayer works because she gets connected to God. Now, on the other hand, I know people that <clears throat> try to handle everything on their own strength. And they're going through horrific things. And they start complaining, this isn't fair. This isn't right. Uh, they're doing this, and they're supposed to be Christians. And, and then they're doing that, and it doesn't make any sense. you know. And then they're complaining, and they say, you know what? I don't want to go to church. You know, I don't want to go to the fellowship. I don't want to do these things. And I asked them, have you been praying to God? Well, no. Why not? Because they don't have that connection to the Lord. They don't realize that God can do anything. And so they sit up and curl up in a ball and they do nothing. They do nothing instead of letting God do the work. And if they do anything, they try to do it with their own strength. Well, I tried this, and I called this person, but it didn't work, and they wouldn't listen to me. And I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't listen to you either. Why don't you try giving it to God? Why don't you go to God? Why don't you lay it before his throne? He created the heavens and the earth. He can intervene. He can change man's hearts. He can do anything. Do you really believe that? Well, but you don't understand. It's just not fair. You know, when I ask this, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. You're not connected to God. You're doing it in your own strength and power. There is so much power in prayer. We need to be connected to God. I don't care how many times you push buttons on your computer. Unless you're connected to the Wi-Fi, you're not going anywhere. You just aren't. You just aren't. And it's sad. Because then when you reveal this to them, then you come off as, well, you're being a little cruel. You're being mean. You're insensitive. You're, You're not hearing what I'm saying and the difficulties that I'm going through. No, I hear them all. And obviously you've, exhausted every path and God's got you right here so why not just accept his will and then see what he has for you why not just bring it all to him and say now what Lord you tell me where to go instead of crawling up you know some little area of your house and rolling up and just saying you know what I'm depressed you know I don't want to do this anymore no stand up and glorify God in the position that you're at because he can change things He created the heavens and the earth. Things that can hinder prayer. Philippians 4, 6, anxieties hinders prayer. Being anxious for things, not being patient, not waiting on the Lord. That's probably the hardest thing is waiting on the Lord. Uh, Disobedience hinders prayers. Deuteronomy 1, 43 and Deuteronomy 3 uh, talk about Our prayers being hindrance because we are not obeying the word of the Lord. Doubt hinders prayer. James tells us that, that we can't doubt, but doubt will hinder prayer. Failure to heed God's laws, and we'll see that in Ezekiel tonight, that failure to heed God's laws will also hinder prayer. Um, Failure to remain in Christ hinders prayer. If you're living a life outside of Christ and you're living your own life in your own hands, then that hinders prayer also. Faithlessness hinders prayer. Forsaking God hinders prayer. Haughtiness, that's pride, hinders prayer. Uh, Job 35, 12. Hypocrisy hinders prayer. Psalm 78. Idolatry hinders prayer. We've seen that with Jeremiah chapter 11, the idolatry of the people. And God said, you know what? I'm not even listening to you anymore. An improper uh, relationship with your spouse hinders prayer. 
Insincerity hinders prayer, Deuteronomy 4, not 29. And then irreverence to God also hinders prayer. There are a lot of things that hinder prayer, and this list can go on and on. I found it in the, in the scriptures, and you just go, wow, Lord, I'm in big trouble. You know, I need to work on some of these areas. I need to just trust and have faith in you, keep my life right with you. Zedekiah here, prayers are hindered in this chapter. He's going to pray, and God's not going to hear him. In fact, he's a little too late in his prayer. It's gone to the point where God now has to deal with Zedekiah and the nation of Israel. Now, for us, this is the Old Testament, but we're under grace. It's never too late for us. We can always come to God when we repent and turn from our ways. Whatever's hindered in our prayer, get right, and God will hear us. And that's what's beautiful about the Lord. It doesn't matter. Uh, I know of people who, who just, uh, the, you know, they're not always in church. They're not always participating. Um, they're very inactive in and out. But when it comes to prayer and the time to need a prayer, boy, are they committed. And what's so interesting is God answers their prayer, you know, because they understand the power of that prayer. In chapters 21 through 23, Jeremiah is going to pronounce judgments on the political leadership of Israel. So those that are in charge, those that are ruling the nation there. And Jeremiah is known as a great prayer warrior. And so the reason that Zedekiah comes to him is because he knows that Jeremiah is connected with God. That's who you want to go to, to people that are connected to God, where where you know they're in prayer. You know that God hears their prayers because then you become very powerful. Even though Zedekiah hated Jeremiah, uh, tried to have him uh, killed even, he still realized that Zedekiah realized that uh, Jeremiah was connected to God. I remember working for Southern California Edison And it was Chris Fox, who was a female that worked in our office also. Um, I would try to share my faith with those in in the room periodically. And she would always kind of smirk, you know. You just hear her kind of, you know. And once in a while, she'd contradict me. And supposedly she was a believer. And and she would do that periodically. So I knew there was something there. There was already friction, you know, the the light and darkness, that, that whole thing. Even though she claimed to be a Christian. And in fact, we once started talking about the Trinity and she just interrupted and said, I don't believe in the Trinity. I don't believe in the Trinity. So I discussed it with her in front of everybody, you know, and gave her the evidence and she just kind of, you know, just blew me away, blew me off. And so then, uh, you know, years went by and I guess her and her husband were trying to get pregnant and so she got pregnant and she was having difficulty with the pregnancy. And so she comes to me and says, I know we haven't always gotten along. Well, no, you haven't gotten along. I I get along just fine. (laughs) I didn't say that to her, but I'm thinking that, you know, because I'm waiting for the next line. And then she says, but I need you to pray for me. I'm like, oh, okay. See, they they know. And and when there's a need and they understand that need, they're going to go to someone they know that knows God and has a relationship with them. So I prayed for her, and it was amazing because we became, you know, friends, you know, even though we disagreed because of her doctrine in the churches she went to. At least she changed from that point on because God did get her through that pregnancy, and they had a little boy. Here, Judah's, Judah's uh, last king, Zedekiah, sends a, a delegation to request God's help against the Babylonian um, invasion there upon Judah. So let's look at the appeal for Jeremiah to intercede here in verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him, uh, Pusher. Now, Pusher is not the same guy in chapter 20. He's a different guy, and we'll see him again in chapter 38. And at that time, Jeremiah will literally ask that uh, he be killed uh, because of his idolatry and participation as a political leader. Now, he's the son of Melchi, and Zephaniah, the chief of security referred uh, here, um, is also found later in Jeremiah chapter 29. He is the son of Mishah, the priest saying, 
please inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, makes war against us. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was the second greatest king of Babylon. He is known in the Bible as both for his um, conquests in Jerusalem in nine or 597, 2 Kings 24, and also in 587, 2 Kings 25, and for having rebuilt uh, Babylon into a great city. And we all have heard of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, who, who creates this great statue because he has a dream, which is a reference to the end times. Well, he's going to make war. It says, perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful works that the king may go away from us. So you see Zedekiah's prayer through this delegation. Jeremiah, we're coming to you. You know, we're hoping you forget what, you, you forget what we've done, you know, and you have some grace and mercy because Babylon's coming against us and this is a great king and we know that and we need help. Uh, hopefully God will do a wonderful work and he will deliver us from this uh, awful uh, king, Nebuchadnezzar. Now he may be thinking, that is Zedekiah may be thinking uh, about Hezekiah and how the Lord helped uh, Hezekiah get through some close situations. And so he may be thinking, well, if God helped Hezekiah, then maybe God can help me too. And again, uh, the reference is that we need to go to people that have experienced that, you know. And sometimes when you're in, in need, we call out to God because we know that he helps. And we've seen it uh, with others. You know, you've, you've known somebody that the Lord helped. Uh, you know someone that, that has gone through something that you know they couldn't do it, that it had to be a miracle. There's just no way in, in human strength that someone could do something like that. And so you contribute it to God. And so you know there's a God. And, and you know that he can help. And you know that if I call on him, that maybe he can help me too. And that's probably what he was doing. So God had told Jeremiah not to pray, though, uh, for his unrepentant people. Uh, in the past, in, in chapter 7, chapter 11, and chapter 14, you remember how the Lord said to be silent, not to say anything to them, don't even receive their prayers. It was Zedekiah who hated Jeremiah, <clears throat> um, even though uh, he knew that uh, Jeremiah was his only connection to God in hope to be delivered from Nebuchadnezzar. When we look at um, Zedekiah, we know that he tried to um, kill Jeremiah. He had one time put him in a cistern, you remember that? Uh, and hopefully to, to kill him in that manner. Uh, later on, uh, Nebuchadnezzar will, will take him and put him to rule over for a while, but then he will take Zedekiah and his sons, and he will kill his sons in front of him, and then he will kill uh, him. Look at the answer that Jeremiah gives from the Lord. Then Jeremiah said to them, Thus you shall say to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands. So, Zedekiah, you have weapons to defend yourself against this nation. I'm going to actually turn those weapons on yourself. I'm going to take those weapons and they aren't going to be any use to you whatsoever because you're too late in your prayer with which you fight against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans who besiege you outside the wall and I will assemble them in the midst of this city I myself will fight against you so God will literally fight against Judah here with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm. Now, you know that's speaking figuratively because God is spirit, right? And those who worship God must worship in truth and spirit. And so this is just giving us the idea that it's going to be with the power of God, with God's might and power that God is going to fight against Judah. With a strong arm, even in anger and fury and great wrath. I will strike the inhabitants of the city, both man and beast, and they shall die of a great pestilence many of the ruling class here those that were in political power literally died during this time 
And afterwards, says the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, his servants and the people and such as are left in the city from the pestilence and the sword and the famine into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hands of their enemy and into the hands of those who seek their lives. And he shall strike them with the edge of the sword. He shall not spare them nor have pity or mercy. Now you shall say this to the people. Thus says the Lord, behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Life and death is before you. Isn't it that before all of us? Isn't it life and death before us all? All of us will die one day. All of us are living right now and we have choices and we make those choices based upon life and based upon death. Deuteronomy 30.15 says, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, as God spoke to the children of Israel. You will have opportunities to choose life and good, and you will have opportunities to choose death and evil. And we all have those things, don't we? We can choose the right path, the narrow path, with struggles and all, or we can choose the broad path, which leads to destructions. Now, there are two spiritual ways, aren't there? God has showed us that there's two spiritual ways. There, there is the spiritual life, and there's also the spiritual death that will take place in the end. Uh, there are two ways that a righteous man are to live in this world. We see that in Psalms 1. If you want to turn there, you can do that. <clears throat> And we see it so clearly. We see two paths, two ways, uh, two different individuals and how they respond to God. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his law, he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Wow, what a nice life. Why? Because he delights in the law of the Lord. He meditates in it. Now, the word meditate is an interesting word. It's not just thinking about it. You can think about a few scriptures, you know, uh, again, uh, like uh, he said earlier, uh, the way of life and the way of death. Think about that, you know, the way of life, the way of death. God has put that in before us all. And you can meditate on it. The Hebrew word for meditate here is <clears throat> regurgitating it. And literally, it's like a cow who, who bites into his food. He chews it and then he swallows it after sucking all the taste out of it. And then he regurgitates it and chews on it again, you know, sucking all the taste on it, and then he swallows it again. And then he regurgitates it again, and he chews on it, and just sucking every bit that he can out of it. Now, isn't that gross? But it gives you the idea about really thinking hard on it. What is the implications here? What is God really trying to say? Uh, you, you see a man here who delights himself in the laws of the Lord, uh, not just reads the word of God, but he lives it. He believes it. He trusts in it. Uh, he will stand up for it. He will fight for it. He will rebuke for it because he really delights in the word of God as being the truth. That it's the very nature of God who is the word. And because he does that, God blesses him. He blesses him because he delights in the word of the Lord. And so he's like that tree. He's planted by the river of water. There's plenty of resources for him to draw from. And he prospers because he's doing everything right and accordingly. That's a good way to go, I think. You want to be blessed. Delight yourself in the law of the Lord. Now, well, what do we have to do? You have to read your Bible and see what God wants you to do what you should be doing to delight yourself in the law of the Lord. Now look at the other person, verse 4. The ungodly are not so. So the ungodly, the unbeliever, doesn't delight in the word of God. But are like the shaft, which the wind drives away. Isn't that interesting how he gives that description? They would, they would take their, their wheat and they would find a, a little hill where the wind was blowing 
and they they would uh, take their their wheat and they would throw it in the air. They take a shovel, their fork, whatever, and they throw it in the air. And as the wind's coming, uh, the light stuff just floats away. But then eventually it falls, and it, it usually piles up in the same spot because they're throwing it in the same spot. And so the wheat falls in one place, the shaft falls in another place. And then what they do is then they take a match, and they just light the shaft, and whoosh, they just burn it up like that. And so that's the ungodly. They just, they're like being thrown, and whoosh, the wind just takes them. There's no substance. There's no blessing there whatsoever. It's just being consumed by the fire. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall what? Perish. Logically, I think we'd all agree to choose the other way, right? That makes sense to me. To choose the other way. For an individual to say, hey, this way, delighting myself in the law of the Lord and godliness and righteousness and having a relationship with Jesus and being a part of his fellowship and, and, and working the gifts that God has given us and, and just really enjoying all of that, that's a good way to go because I'm blessed. And it's a blessing. Or go the way of the unrighteous and get into drugs Forget church. Who needs it? I'll do what I want. I'll enjoy what I want and do all these things. You'll perish. Yeah, it makes sense. Go this way. But some people actually think it makes sense doing this other way. Why? Why do they do that? Because they want to do their own thing. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to be responsible. I don't want to grow. I don't want pain. I don't want suffering. It's easy to do it this way. And so they choose the path of least resistance. Yeah. If you're going to have a great event take place, there's always casualties, aren't there? Always casualties. We wanted, not we, but our forefathers wanted to build a Christian nation. Well, guess what? As they were building it, there were casualties on the, on the way of building that thing. Always casualties on the way. You're always going to struggle. Look at Jesus. He was about to do a great work on the cross. He was going to offer up himself as a sacrifice for the world casualties on the way struggles pain suffering yeah it's hard it's narrow it's very dogmatic in some areas you know and that's the way that you have to choose because you have to battle yourself through those things or the other way least resistance oh i'm just having fun i'm enjoying it you know i don't care about education i don't care about life i don't care i just want to have fun i just want to do what i want to do that's the way i choose well, you choose death is what you're choosing. There's two ways, and it's up to us to choose that. Uh, Jesus said the narrow way, you can turn back, <clears throat> the narrow and the broad way. He gave us two ways there. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the great gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Boy, uh, that broad way is, is a way that has every philosophy you can think of. You know, every thought, Every logic. The narrow way is narrow-minded. Really, it is. You ever get called narrow-minded as a believer? I know I have. You're so narrow-minded. You know, you're not open to new ideas. No, I'm narrow-minded, and I want to stay narrow-minded because that's the way to eternal life. You want me to get broad? No, that's the way to destruction, Jesus said. Because narrow is a gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. Yeah, it's a struggle. Yeah, it's hard to do the right thing. Yeah, it's tough to live a righteous life. Those things are hard because the flesh is battling against those things all the time. And it's very difficult. Thank be to God that, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? As Paul would say, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Romans chapter 7. And then, thank be to God. Because the flesh is wicked and evil. It just it wants the broad way. And I know that. I like the broad way. But my spirit says you've got to go the narrow way. And in the narrow way, you will offend people. In the narrow way, it will be a struggle. In the narrow way, you have troubles and tribulations. Guaranteed. But you're on the path to eternal life. And it is worth it completely. <clears throat> I 
I had to, it's just, it's fresh in me. And here's what's sad about it all, is I've done this before, and the same response. Different people, but it's just so interesting. I, I find it so interesting, and I see it because I'm a pastor, and, and I see it in people's lives all the time. You know, you may know a, a friend or two, and they go through something, but I see it because the church is bigger, and I deal with a lot of people, and so I see this quite often. But I had to correct this individual, and... The first thing that they said, just like many others have said, it's none of your business. Like, well, <clears throat> I didn't say this, but in my head I says, well, yes it is. It is my business. And it's your business. We're to hold each other accountable. Uh, we're to stand for righteousness. Uh, we have a responsibility because we're a part of the kingdom of God. If you're outside the kingdom, then yeah, that's none of my business. <laughs> you do what you want. But you're calling yourself a believer. You're a part of the kingdom of God. So yeah, it's, it's my business. And my business is to see you walk with God rightly. Do you understand that? No, you don't care about myself or my children at all. Like, really? I think it's the other way around. You don't care because you're choosing to live this sinful life instead of living for God. You're jeopardizing your children's life, not me. You're making those decisions. And it's the same response because they're not willing to choose the narrow way which leads to eternal life. But they want the broad way because they're living in sin and they want to enjoy that sin. And they don't want someone telling them not to live that way. The Bible says life and death belong to you. 1 Corinthians 3. It belongs to us. We have free will, don't we? You all chose to come here tonight, right? Right? Someone may have nudged you a little bit, but you chose to come here. Um, you made the choice to be a part of this church. That's free will. Uh, all of us chose to accept Jesus Christ or to reject Jesus Christ. We made that verbal confession before others. We have the choice of life or death. It's up to us to choose that. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, the Bible says, Proverbs 18.21. It's in our tongue. The Bible says that, that what comes out of the mouth is from the heart. You know how sometimes you say things and you go, oh, shouldn't have said that. Well, that was in your heart. It's in the power of the tongue. And, and the tongue either chooses life or it chooses death. As a, as a man is born, so shall he die. Ecclesiastics 5.16. We all deal with life being born and we all deal with death because one day we will all die that is for sure whether we live or die we are the lord's romans 14 8 so whether we live or whether we die we're god's children and so how ought we to live for christ for this christ died and rose that we might be the lords of dead and living romans 14 so christ comes in and he dies so that we can live instead of dying. And Christ will be exalted in my body by life or by death. That's an interesting phrase, Philippians 1.20. God will either be exalted by the way we live and by the way we die, that we glorify him in those things. Look at verse 9. <clears throat> so choose before you life and death God has before us all. He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence. So three things, the sword, famine, and pestilence. Not only will I remove your power and your weapons, but their swords will destroy you. And if that doesn't kill you all, then famine will kill you. No food, no water. If that doesn't get you, then pestilence. But he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans who besiege you, he shall live. And his life shall be as a prize to him. So what God is saying here is, look, you have a choice. You want to choose death? Then fight, and you'll die. Or do you want to choose life? Then give in and go over to the Chaldeans because that's where I'm sending you. And God presents that to all of us, even to this day. Do you want to have life? Then choose me. Choose my way. Be obedient to my word. If you say you love me, 
The Bible says, then follow my commandments and you'll have life. Because he who knows me has life, the Bible says. Or you can choose death by going your own way, fighting your own battles, in your own strength and in your power. Do it all and you'll die. At least you fought though. And at least I tried to do the best I can. Yeah, but you still die, unfortunately. So choose again. So those who surrendered to Babylon would lose their property, uh, their freedom, their citizenship, but they would escape with their lives. Verse 10, For I have set my face against this city for adversity, and not for good, says the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. And concerning the house of the king of Judah, says, Hear the word of the Lord. O house of David, thus says the Lord, execute judgment in the morning. Now, the word morning there is suggesting every morning. Execute proper judgment. It was the customs for the political leaders, and that's who he's talking to here, was to go every day to the gates. When we were in uh, Israel, um, we went to one of Abraham's cities, I believe it was, and as we were there, there was this gate made out of stone. And you can actually see the threshold, and you could actually see holes where the doors were probably sitting. So you can almost imagine the gate doors opening and closing. And as you walk into through the gates, it was probably an area about this big before you entered into the city part, which there was no wall, so it was just kind of just the land. But they had these gates, and so there would be like a, a bench that probably as you enter in just a little bit further, it would come out and then go along that side until it went in the gate. So everyone would sit there, all the judges, the political leaders, and you'd come in and if you had a, a case or a grievance, then you would bring it to them and then the, they would make the judgment calls on each of those, those cases there. So what God is saying is that make a good judgment. Make a judgment for me uh, more than anything else. And deliver him who is... Uh, plundered out of the hand of the oppressor, lest my fury go forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. The evil of your doings. <clears throat> Rich is going to share with us on Sunday. Uh, he's going to continue on in, in humanism. In humanism. See, humanism basically is trying to live without God. When you live without God, you begin to do evil things because there's no limit to what you can do. You can live whatever way you want to live. If God has a rule, well, that doesn't apply to me because there is no God, and so I can live like an animal if I want to live that way. But there is a God, and we live in a society that has moral values, that has laws and regulations and so forth, and so to a certain degree, we're bound by these laws. You're driving down the road, the sign says stop, you're to stop. Now some people think that I don't need to stop, I'm going to do my own thing and run the, run the stop, and then they get a ticket, and like, oh man, I got a ticket. You know, we break the law, you pay the fine. So we have these laws that are set up. But there are moral laws that God has given to us that are even embedded in our own hearts. We know what those moral laws are. I mean, we know not to kill someone, right? We, we know that. We just know it. No one has to tell you that. If you're in a fight and, and you get the opportunity to pull a knife out, you're going, I know something's wrong in doing this. And so most, normally most people would not do that. Unfortunately, there are those who don't believe in God. And so you have these kids going out killing police officers. You have these Muslims, and just saw the video today, uh, a police officer in Paris was walking his route, and two guys jump out of the car with machine guns, and they start shooting at him, and walked up to him and just killed him. All the cars stopped, and they're all you know ducking for cover, and uh, they got their mask on in a whole bit, made sure he's dead, looking around at everyone, got back in the car and took off. You know, that's living without God. That's doing evil. There's no conscience there whatsoever. And for them, that's normal. 
That's not normal for the normal person that, that walks around to do something like that. that that's pretty evil. What, what makes us like that? Why do we become like that? Because we're sin nature. And we give in to sin. We give in to our passions and we give in to our desires. That's it. We do what we do because we give in to those things. And so either we choose to give in to our flesh or we choose to give in to God. And if we choose to give in to our flesh, then we begin to do evil. I could remember as a kid growing up in uh, Roland Heights and... Marijuana was popular, and I'm sure it's popular today. It's, it's not going to be unpopular. And we have them dispensaries right here on this on Etiwanda, I think two, just on Etiwanda. And so you can get marijuana if you have a medical condition. <clears throat> and, and I can remember thinking, well, what's wrong with marijuana? You know, it makes you feel good. Everyone's doing it. Again, you're living without God. You have those choices. And so I can remember smoking marijuana. Virginia never did. She didn't, she didn't care for it. She didn't care for any of that stuff. But I would do it. And then one of our best friends, me and her would do it. And we thought it was hilarious to do it. That's doing evil. That's taking what God has created and misusing it in the wrong way. If we were to die right there, we'd die in our sins and go to hell. But thank God that he had other plans for us. Why do we do those things? Because we give in to our passions of our flesh. And what we need to do is, is really understand the flesh, the works of the flesh, and then understand the fruits of the Spirit and give in to the fruits of the Spirit. And they're very simple when you look at it. And Jesus even combined it into two basic laws. Look, love God and then love your neighbor. And you fulfill the whole law. And that's what we should do. I find it interesting how children are. You know, when, when my boys were, were growing up, or even I see Ethan. Now, Ethan's a good hard worker. He loves working hard. I think when you put him to work, I'll tell him, Ethan, go out to the pool and, and, and brush it. Uh, <clears throat> and it was, was when it was raining. I just kind of said, hey, go out there. It's not raining right now. He got out there. And he's like brushing that pool. I mean, he got the whole pool brushed. And then it started raining. He was still out there brushing the pool. He's, he's a hard worker. You tell him to do something and, and he does it. At least when I tell him. I don't know what he's like at home because I'm not there with him. Maybe he does it. But I can remember the boys not doing things. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. And so they just don't do it. They loaf around and not do things. But it's so funny how if they are asked to do something fun, you know, like, oh, let's climb this tree or this mountain. And they're like climbing and it's hard. Their muscles are straining. They're sweating. Yeah, but this is fun. This is great, you know. And then you go, can you take the trash out? Oh, man, you little trash. Oh, you know how heavy that is, you know. Why is that? Why does our flesh rebel and yet climb a mountain? For three hours you're climbing and stretching and getting scratched. Take out the trash. Oh, that means I have to pick out the trash and open the door and dump it in the can. Oh, you know how hard that is? Really? It's because our flesh doesn't want to do it simple as that so we give into the flesh and we complain and murmur and all of that stuff or we give into the spirit and say hey i do all of this stuff too i can do this it's not a big deal you have to have a hunger and a desire to do it i think that's one of the reasons that one of them is that i made sure that my boys saw that i worked and if i worked they work if I was at church working, they were with me at church working. So it wasn't just dad saying, go do this, go do that. And I just kind of relax. And I was there with them. Uh, <clears throat> when we first bought our house, we, we have fruit trees. Those of you that have been there, fruit trees. Well, the neighbor of mine who grew fruit trees said, you, what you need to do is dig a trench four feet deep and about three feet wide and just throw manure in there. Dig the trench in the center. And then when the trees start to grow, the, the roots will go into that area water soaks in there and so they get water really easy so I thought, okay sounds sounds logical and so every day after work i was out there with the boys and we're digging a four four foot deep trench you know three feet wide every day i was with them digging it it wasn't just just you go dig it and i'll watch you type of thing and so that's why i believe they're hard workers that's why i believe that they know that you need to work and that working is okay you know, and that you should do it. And so 
crucifying the flesh, making it enjoyable, making it understandable that this is a necessity, this is life, this is how it works, you know, and so forth. It's the flesh. It is the flesh that Paul says you need to crucify. You know, Jesus said, pick up your cross. These are things that we just need to do because narrow is the way. It's difficult and it's hard. Otherwise, we're left to doing evil things. And that's what's sad because those evil things lead to to death. Behold, verse 13, I am against you, O inhabitants of the valley and the rock of the plain, says the Lord. Who says who shall come down against us and who shall enter our dwellings? And this is in the negative sense. You can almost hear the people say, well, who's going who's gonna to stop us? Who's going to come against us? We're doing fine. No one has to tell me what to do. No one has to direct me. I'm doing just fine. But I will punish you, the Lord said. You according to the fruit of your doings, says the Lord. I will kindle a fire in its forest and it shall devour all things around you. Zedekiah prayed to Jeremiah, asked Jeremiah, could you pray to the Lord for us? Could you ask him? just stop the sword from coming and jeremiah said this is what the lord said you're gonna die (laughs) you're gonna die it's too late jeremiah i mean zedekiah it's too late you've done evil things and you've gone beyond so this is what's going to happen to you all the political leaders will die you will die the people will go into captivity it's not too late for us the bible says if we repent that is Turn from our decision makings and make right decisions. God says, I will bless you. You'll be like the tree planted by the river of water. It's never too late. As we saw on Sunday, hope in the Lord, doing new things in the Lord means a fresh start. And it's every morning. And we can even start tonight by just saying, Lord, I want to live a life for you. I want to delight in your law. I want to be obedient to you. I want to go down the narrow path and not the wide that leads to destruction. Before you this evening is life or death. You make the choice. Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for your word and for your warning to us today. Even though this took place years ago, Lord God, and was real in Zedekiah's life in Jeremiah, Lord. Though here we're challenged with our own struggles, Lord, between life and death. Lord, we pray we choose life, Lord. So difficult to do. Forgive us, Lord, when we make the wrong choices. We walk the wrong path, Lord. When we do that, Lord, I pray that you will remind us at that moment, I told you not to go this route. But I want you to know it's not too late. You can turn back because I love you. And I've taken your sins, past, present, and future, but just return like the prodigal son because I love you. Remind us of that, Lord, when we go down the wrong path, Lord. When we choose death. And we begin to see it around us, Lord. And we realize I've made the wrong choice. That we can come back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.